Hello, my name is Deanna Georgeson. Welcome to Art History Continuums, where we explore the connections between works of art from different historical periods. Our first presentation explores the influence that Manet's painting, called Le Déjeuner sur l'air, from 1863, had on the following styles, Impressionism, Modernism, and Postmodernism. Welcome to Le Déjeuner sur l'air, or Luncheon on the Grass, an art history continuum that explores connections between the following painters. Titian represents the Venetian Renaissance in Italy. Manet represents a transition from realism to Impressionism. Monet represents Impressionism. Picasso represents Modernism. And Yue Minjun represents Postmodernism. These painters are connected to an art history continuum by their relationship to Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'air. We enter this art history continuum by examining a Renaissance painting called Pastoral Concert, created in 1510 by Titian, perhaps in collaboration with his teacher, Giorgione. A wealthy Venetian patron commissioned this painting as an addition to his private collection. In 1671, the Pastoral Concert was sold to a French king, Louis XIV, and is now exhibited in the Louvre in Paris. It is painted on a large canvas, approximately 41 by 54 inches, which was the conventional scale for painting classical history subjects during the Renaissance. The pastoral concert is painted in the Venetian Renaissance style with careful attention to atmospheric light and color. In keeping with acceptable Renaissance subject matter, this painting interprets a poem. Two idealized women, symbolically depicted playing the flute and pouring water, illustrate idealized figures in an allegorical Roman poem. These unreal female figures exist only in the imaginations of the two clothed men they inspire. According to the Venetian taste at the time for simultaneous depictions of the visible and the invisible, the main group of figures is seated in the foreground, at the center of the landscape. In the background, under a grove of trees, a herdsman tends his sheep. This painted image represents landscape as a state of mind, where humans and nature coexist in perfect harmony. Three stylistic features identify this Renaissance painting. One, invisible brush strokes. Two, chiaroscuro, gradual transitions between light and dark tones. Three, linear perspective is used to create the illusion of spatial depth. The second painting and the title of this presentation is focused on a painting called Le Déjeuner sur l'air by Edouard Manet, created in 1863. It signifies a turning point in the history of European art. Manet was a French artist who lived and worked in Paris. He admired, studied, and copied the work of Renaissance masters when he visited the Louvre. He was particularly inspired by Titian's painting, The Pastoral Concert. Manet composed Le Déjeuner sur l'air on a large-scale canvas, approximately 82 by 105 inches, as a tribute to the Renaissance master. However, Titian's Renaissance audience was told what the meaning of the Renaissance painting was in the context of an original poetic story. Titian's classical Renaissance influence, which inspired Manet, was counterbalanced by Manet's subversive interpretation. Manet did not justify his choice of subject, nudes having a picnic with clothed men, by claiming that his painting was an allegory. Manet, in bold defiance of the Renaissance narrative tradition, refused to tell the audience what his painting meant. He wanted to show us that paintings do not have to represent historical events to be significant or worthy of our attention. Classical allegorical paintings substitute descriptive narrative for aesthetic presence. This focus on storytelling prevented paintings from being directly experienced and appreciated for their formal qualities and compositional arrangements. These aesthetic considerations include the organization of shapes, values, colors, lines, textures, and spatial relationships. Le Déjeuner sur l'air is not a historical allegory that represents an idealized world, but a mysterious tableau of recognizable people. Manet posed his favorite model, his wife, his brother, and his brother-in-law as subjects against a backdrop of what appears to be a Parisian park. This combination of past and present references 
created an unreal scene which viewers were not able to understand. And it shocked the public's sensibilities. Manet's style of painting was considered vulgar during the Victorian era when it was painted because he painted real people, not idealized imaginary figures, and also because the nude is staring directly out at the audience. Apart from Manet's scandalous choice of live models as his subjects, there are three formal reasons why Manet's painting does not conform to traditional classical Renaissance painting style. One, no chiaroscuro. Manet did not paint subtle gradations between light and dark tones, but instead leaves abrupt contrast between tones. Due to this focus on visual tensions between shapes, Manet was reproached for his mania for seeing in blocks. Two, no linear perspective. Manet deliberately avoided using the Renaissance technique of applying linear perspective to create the illusion of spatial depth. The characters in his composition seem to fit uncomfortably into the sketchy wooded background with no clear vanishing point. 3. Visible brush strokes. Manet did not blend his brush strokes to create a smooth finished surface, but allowed the physical process of applying paint to a canvas to show through. At this point, you may be wondering why Manet's painting became so famous in the history of European art. When Manet submitted Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe to the annual Paris exhibition called the Salon, it was rejected, along with many other now famous paintings by artists such as Cézanne and Whistler. The year 1863 is important because the Salon des Refusés, or Salon of the Refused, came into being. The Salon des Refusés was an exhibition held in Paris by command of the French Emperor Napoleon III for those artists whose works were rejected by the official Salon jury. Manet's painting, Les Déjeuners sur l'air, became a principal attraction during the Salon des Refusés. It generated both laughter and scandal because it did not conform to the public's expectations of good taste or to the moral standards that critics expected classical art to uphold. Le Déjeuner sur l'air changed the history of European art. It is a testimony to Manet's appreciation for, yet refusal to conform with, historical conventions of narrative painting subjects and modes of representation. This painting could be considered the turning point for modern art because it allowed the Impressionists the freedom they needed to paint common scenes rather than grand, symbolic stories. In the third slide, we see the Impressionist painter Monet's interpretation of Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe from 1865, just two years after his friend Manet had created such a scandal with the original Le Déjeuner. Monet's composition did not create sensational news. Monet lacked the conceptual subtleties of Manet's treatment of the allegorical pastoral concert, which confronted the art establishment. Monet ignored the original theme of the Renaissance pastoral concert and paints only what he sees in a presumed park, using a fresh, lively palette that does resemble Titian's colors. This painting reveals Monet's talent for observing the play between color and light, which is a defining feature of the Impressionist aesthetic and why Monet stands out as a leader of the Impressionist movement. The fourth slide leads us to one of Picasso's interpretations of Le Déjeuner, inspired by Manet's original painting. In 1932, Picasso saw Manet's famous painting exhibited in Paris. He was so impressed, he wrote this message on the back of the gallery envelope. When I see Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, I tell myself there is pain ahead. Picasso had studied many European masters, including Poussin, Velazquez, and Rembrandt but his attempts to come to terms with Manet's painting was the most remarkable tribute that one painter has ever paid another, from 1959 until the end of his career. Picasso completed a series of 27 paintings, 140 drawings, and sculptures based on the figures posed in Manet's painting. This was the most profound and complex exploration of any subject that Picasso ever undertook. Picasso admired Manet's modernity and subversive attitude. Even though Picasso predicted his involvement with Manet's painting in 1932, he waited 24 years before he began to seriously confront it with his own variations. In 1954, Picasso opened a sketchbook and wrote on the cover, First, Drawings of Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, 1954. 
At that time, he completed four drawings based on Manet's painting. He studied its layout, its protagonists, and the formal relationships between these elements. Picasso, like Manet before him, copied and interpreted at the same time. He modified the original composition, like Manet had done with the Renaissance work that inspired him. Today, in our postmodern world, we refer to this practice of borrowing another person's work without their permission as appropriation. From 1954 to 1959, Picasso explored many variations of Manet's composition in drawings. There was no pain involved in any of these experiments, only amusement, and typically for Picasso, showmanship. Picasso took his time reducing his anguish towards Manet's painting. In 1960, he produced his first painted version of Le Déjeuner sur l'air. In this slide, we see another variation by Picasso, appropriating or borrowing the composition from Manet's original painting, Le Déjeuner sur l'air. Picasso rearranged the players in the scene, reorganizing the formal elements into a new composition. The characters change roles and positions in the play, receding or coming forward, establishing a new scene each time. Like Manet, Picasso was not following representational conventions, but was making a statement in favor of artistic freedom. In 1962, Picasso designed a set of sculptural models based on the characters from Le Déjeuner. These large cardboard figures were folded and placed in real landscape settings for Picasso to photograph and create new arrangements to experiment with. Later, a sculptor was hired to create concrete versions of these models, which are permanently located in a real park. Picasso transformed the original composition into many new arrangements of the figures. In 1970, when Picasso was 89 years old, he painted his final interpretation of La Déjeuner sur l'air. Picasso transcended his connection to Manet's painting by referring to the whole history of painting and establishing himself as a significant part of the art history continuum. Manet was the first painter to break with tradition, while at the same time referring back to the Renaissance masters. Picasso, a leader of the modern art movement, recognized that he was participating in a dialogue about painting. Perhaps it was at this intersection, where the painter challenges the past, that the source of Picasso's anguish resided. In the final slide, we see the work of a contemporary postmodern Chinese artist, Yue Minjun, once again practicing the art of appropriation. Minjun creates self-portraits by photographing himself in a variety of poses as reference material for paintings and sculptures. Every image Minjun creates includes his enigmatic, exaggerated smile. Like Manet and Picasso before him, he never tells us what this smile means. The repeated, smiling portrait of Yui Minjun is a postmodern phenomenon which is being defined by modernism. Postmodernists combine respect and ridicule towards modernism because they see it as a failed attempt to represent an unachievable utopia. When we look at Min Jun's Le Déjeuner, we might ask ourselves, why does every character wear the same smile? Does Min Jun respect European art history, or is he ridiculing it? We are never certain of the artist's intentions. Perhaps they represent artificial smiles that can be purchased and applied like makeup. Can these smiles be manufactured in large quantities, like mass-produced and consumed products? These questions are open to interpretation. However, unlike the allegorical Renaissance paintings, we have no artistic authority telling us what to think, or if we're correct. We must reach our own conclusions.